the power broker himself, the emperor, David <laughs> Sachs, the emperor of his new republic. <laughs> Anybody have any interest, anything going on interesting this week? Any interesting <laughs> moments for people on the national stage? No? Okay. Well, let's get right into the docket. First around the docket, Ron DeSantis, Governor Ron DeSantis, announced his bid on the internet uh, on something called Twitter Spaces. And it looks like almost 10 million viewers have seen it so far across all the different spaces. And Donald Trump wasn't too pleased. He said, Rob, my big red button is bigger, better, stronger, and it's working truth because when Elon fired up the Twitter spaces, it went to 650,000 viewers in under five minutes and then blew up everybody's phones. My phone was melting. I could have cooked an egg on the back of it. The Twitter app crashed so many times. But then Sachs, with his meager following of a half a million people or something, then restarted the stream. And so 15 minutes of technical snafus were relieved. And then there was a uh, announcement. And I'll let you take it from there, Sachs. You want me to take you behind the scenes? Take us behind the scenes. <laughs> take us behind the scenes. How did it come together, Sachs? Oh, yeah, even better. Yeah, the way it came together is I think the DeSantis team were interested in potentially, you know, doing something different for their announcement. He also did an appearance on Fox News afterwards, and I think he did a town hall. But I think they saw an opportunity to, to break new ground here in terms of presidential announcements by doing it on Twitter spaces. And so the DeSantis campaign connected with Twitter, and Elon and I agreed to kind of co-host the space and, with him. And he did his announcement. Now, you're right. We had about 15 minutes of technical difficulties because the interest was so intense. At the time the, the room crashed, it had over 700,000 people in it. And there were it crashed because so many people were trying to get in it. I think there was yeah. well over a million people trying to get in it. So you normally don't have this kind of interest. I think this is by far the biggest Twitter space. The, the engineers there told me that the previous order of magnitude was more like 100,000, not a million. And then you combine that with the fact that Elon's account has over 100 million followers, and that basically led to a new level of scale. And you guys understand that when you get to a new level of scale as a platform, there's always going to be some, yeah. some challenges. So in any event, the engineers were there trying to figure out how do we you know, solve this. And we realized the simplest thing to do would just be to restart the room on my account instead of Elon's. And then Elon joins the co-host and we brought DeSantis in and it all worked perfectly at that point. The audio was crisp. We had over 300,000 people in the room. There was also a, another room that had been set up by Mario Nawal, who's like a big Twitter spaces host. And he had hundreds of thousands of people in there. And then he had live commentary from people he invited. And so this ability to fork Twitter spaces into many different rooms and each room gets to decide who they want to be their hosts and their speakers allows you to do live commentary and in a way that you could never have done before. So it was really innovative, I think. Super innovative. And for people yeah. who don't know, Twitter Spaces was really a rush job at Twitter. They did that in reaction to Clubhouse. They it's just it's still basically a beta product that predates Elon being there. And it doesn't have yet the infrastructure or scale of the code base, I don't think, like YouTube and Twitch do, which, you know, have been working on this problem for I don't know, 15 years, maybe the live products. I have two decade. observations. Yeah, go ahead. The first is I thought DeSantis did a really good job just rolling with the punches. Okay. Because I think whether he wins, you're not going to look back on this moment as the defining moment of the campaign, nor whether he loses, will you say that this was where it was it all the beginning of the end. Instead, what this was was a really seminal moment, I think, in further divorcing ourselves away from the mainstream media. And you know that it was that important because Biden tried to troll the whole thing. Nick, you can show <laughs> this link. This link works. And I actually think this is a really terrible idea by the Biden team because never this basically yeah. acknowledges how important the moment was. Yeah. And the fact that even the president of the United States was grinding the link and couldn't get in because there was so much interest is really important. And I think what it speaks to is the fact that we are now showing credibly that you don't need to listen to four channels to shape your consciousness. 
and you can just go straight to the source. And what SAC said is right. If you now have a moderated forum that then gets put out to 50 or 60 different Twitter spaces all at the same time, framing and reframing, it gives people a chance to come to their own conclusion in a totally unique way. So I think it was really, really an important moment for citizen journalism and podcasting and audio formats and all of the things that I think we've been a small part of. But I think that it's really must have tilted the mainstream media and it tilted the establishment. And you can see that in Biden's tweet. Yeah, going direct. Yeah. So that was the first thing. Second thing, mm -hmm. I think DeSantis did a really decent job in rolling with the whole thing and being super cool and just being committed to the process. And I think that says a lot about him as well, which was, again, it's a question mark. And I've said this before, the big money guys got close and then took a step back. So this could be a very good moment for them to reevaluate because I thought he did a very good job. So I agree. So, you know, I was there, I was live, I was seeing what was happening behind the scenes. When DeSantis came on after we, you know, had 15 minutes of technical difficulties, there wasn't a hint of anger. There wasn't a trace of irritation. There wasn't any freaking out that we were potentially ruining his presidential announcement. The guy was completely calm. And more than that, he was in good spirits. I mean, if you listen to the recording, you know, he's happy. He's, his tone was great. His, his tone, tone was great. really good. I mean, yeah. and then, of course, it was very substantive. He spoke in a very articulate way about all the issues. Uh, when Congressman Thomas Massey came on to make a, a comment or question, he was telling a kind of amusing anecdote about when they were in Congress together. And Massey was one of the only members of Congress who uh, had a Tesla, but he comes from Kentucky. So I think his license plate said Kentucky coal on it, KY <laughs> coal. So anyway, you know, the guy was in good spirits. And so I think it does say a lot about what he would be like as a president, cool under fire, doesn't get thrown off his game. You know, again, not an angry guy, you know, mm. which I think will be a real contrast with, let's say, some of the other people in the race. You know, Trump was sort of angrily truthing during the whole thing, you know. So I think it was a pretty strong contrast. Truthing the act of posting to Truth Social. Exactly. So the contrast between the personalities could not have been stronger. Now, to the other point, the Chamath about the traditional media, you're right about what they were saying. If you look at that, the headlines this morning from traditional media outlets that really started within minutes of the, the technical difficulties. The New York Times called the announcement a fiasco. NBC News called it a meltdown. Politico called it horrendous. And, you know, why? I mean, if you... If you know you what I call that? <laughs> Winning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're losing their cool, that's clearly they feel threatened by the fact that a major presidential candidate chose to go direct. Oh, and even being the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal headline is yeah. DeSantis looks to rebound after botched Twitter announcement. But again, what they fail to acknowledge is, and I'm not a DeSantis supporter per se, I'm open minded to him, but I haven't decided one way or the other. But this is a guy that managed to get millions of people in a nanosecond to be activated to hear what he had to say. That is different than basically giving talking points and having surrogates blather through Fox or CNBC mm -hmm. or CNN to hundreds of thousands of people. This is a really important moment, I think, what happened. Okay, right. we got all the positive. Just to finish that point, so if this was a, a political rally, a traditional political rally that had started 20 minutes late, would anybody have said that was a disaster? That happens all the time. No, it was the crashing that made people be like, oh, my phone crashed, you know. I was using the app. I got crashed out of the app, but I, my phone did not crash. So. No, no, yeah, that's what I'm saying. The app crashed a couple of times. because The was, app crashed, yeah. your phone did not crash. Yeah, But in any event, look, this was, at the end of the day, this was a, a an event that started 20 minutes late. Once we started it on my Twitter account, in my mm -hmm. Twitter space, it worked perfectly. There was no yeah. problem. And that's the recording that you can go on Twitter now and listen to. We had about 300,000 people contemporaneously in my Twitter space. I think Mario had a couple hundred thousand. But if you look at the numbers today, there's already 10 million views yeah. for this thing. By the Which way, that's like exactly what times. I predicted, 3 to 10 million yeah. on the replay. And, and that's what you have to look at is replay because the world has moved to asynchronous. Like this was 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Silicon Valley and 6 o'clock. Like, Sorry, is, when was uh, it? In the afternoon? <laughs> in the afternoon. So you have a hysterical overreaction by the traditional media yeah, because whatever. they simply don't like A, 
that Elon is disremediating them by letting yep. the politicians go direct. And then B, he's restored the platform to being a free speech platform. So they jumped on this the first second they could yeah. to try and portray it as a disaster.